Circe. Order of Battle. Primary forces committed to Circe campaign. Clan Mongoose Cluster. Commanders Khan Mitchell Loris, Sarkhan Boroslav Saiz. Though Mitchell Loris commanded the Mongoose Clan, his role in Operation Klondike was more strategic than it was tactical, managing both of his clan's campaign and coordinating with the Novacats in their good natured but competitive race to complete the Southern Campaign. Though Loris fought numerous times on Circe, Sarkhan Sai served as the principal battlefield commander, developing the clan's tactics of fast, deadly attacks, often striking counterintuitively where the enemy was strongest and thus least expecting to be pushed onto the defensive. The predominance of medium class mechs in the clan served them well, giving them an innate mix of speed and firepower that allowed them to imitate their namesake. Clan Novacat Cluster Commanders Khan Philip Drummond, Sarkhan Serena de la Portas. Philip Drummond's service with the Amaris military, and his wife's peripheral involvement in the Prince Eugen revolt, cast a cloud over his leadership of the Novacats, but the martial skills of the force he shaped soon silenced most of his critics. As a former resident of Circe who had fought with Kerensky's forces there before the Second Exodus, Drummond was a natural choice for the Circe operation, and though never more than first among equals, became Kerensky's de facto deputy for the Circe assault. His knowledge of the terrain would prove vital in the Novacat's success. Clan Snowraven Cluster Commanders Khan Stephen McKenna Sarkhan Joyce Merrill Disagreements as to training practices between Khan McKenna, a former naval officer, and Sarkhan Merrill, commander of an SLDF mechanized infantry division, delayed combat certification of the Snow Ravens, and they were the last of the twenty clans judged ready for combat. The resulting combat force was also one of the most flexible, with mech forces comprising only half its operational strength, but with substantial aerospace and infantry elements both of which would prove valuable in Operation Klondike. However, the lack of a resilient mech force would also be the Raven's greatest weakness. Clan Wolverine Cluster Commanders Khan Sarah McEvity Sarkhan Franklin Hallis The history of the not-named clan was purged on the orders of Il Khan after their treachery a short while after Klondike. As such, most of the details of their founding and their role in Operation on, on Circe come second-hand from references in the remembrances of other clans. We know, for instance, that they were commanded by Sarah McEvity, though her own history is no clearer than that of her clan, but the identity of her original deputy has been lost to the mists of time. This treatise assumes that Sarkhan, at the time of the Annihilation, Franklin Hallis, also served in the role during the Circe campaign, though Dwight Robertson has also been advanced as a candidate, but there's no irrefutable evidence for or against Eva being a founder. For clarity, most of this text will simply refer to the Wolverine Sarkhan. What is clear, though, is that for all the accusations levelled at them in the years that followed, the Wolverines fought like their namesakes, tenaciously and with deadly consequence for those who opposed them. The Battle for Circe One of the few naval commanders to hold high rank in the clans, Khan Stephen McKenna, oversaw the initial fleet operations in the Circe system including a series of Pathfinder missions in advance of the main assault. Several picket ships lurked in the outer reaches of the system for months in advance of the assault, listening in on planet communications traffic. They quickly ascertained that no faction retained a significant orbital presence, with only a few satellites remaining from the extensive networks established by the SLDF in exile. All that remained of the extensive orbital industrial complexes that once girdled the world was a broad halo of debris, each satellite destroyed from within by sabotage or from without by anti-satellite weaponry before the factions lost the ability to make space launch. This band of wreckage provided perfect cover for McKenna's second wave of scouts. A few more glittering objects in near orbit hardly noticeable, though care had to be taken to mask their drive plumes, who took extensive imagery of the planet and its surface combined with its electronic intercepts providing a comprehensive picture of the situation on world. Of all the worlds in the Pentagon, Circe is the most inimical to life due to its 700-year Great Year. During this time, the planet's orbits drift significantly within its star's life zone, shifting the climate from scorching to freezing over 350 years. In 2821, Circe was 10 years short of perihelion, and thus near the innermost limits of the star's habitable zone, resulting in much of the landmass being parched deserts. 
Flora, including food stock, was limited to sheltered valleys or man-made enclaves, and water was one of the most precious commodities on the planet, confined to a few landlocked oceans and subterranean lakes. To a modern inhabitant of Circe, with their cold weather gear and the encroachment of glaciers on the settlements, the temperate zones at Perihelion would be submerged under the ice caps at Aphelion in 3184. It would seem to be another world at that time. The espionage missions revealed little or no activity in the equatorial regions. In fact, no permanent habitation with 40 degrees of the equator, though there was evidence of some nomadic scavengers following the herds of Hell's horses accidentally released there by early colonists. With six power blocks in the northern habitable zone and four in the south, there was a measure of detente between some of the power blocks, accompanied by trade, but in many cases open hostilities would continue, albeit sporadically. Two decades of war had seriously eroded the battlefield technologies available to each group, leaving infantry as the principal tool of warfare, operating from heavily fortified compounds, with many of the reservoirs and aquifers surrounded by multiple layers of defences. These installations exploited the difficult conditions on Circe. Dominance of the water and food supply allowed them to control substantial elements of the population, and these resources would, by extension, be the principal targets of the four clans assigned to the assault. Mobile warfare was limited. Mechs and armour were a precious resource, but as with the Inner Sphere in the later succession wars, possession of such a machine conferred a measure of nobility on the owner. Adding to the clan's troubles was Circe itself. The substantially reduced water levels were not a significant issue. The invaders could be supplied from orbit, and mechs could be calibrated to function effectively in the high temperatures, but the weather systems did pose a threat to even the clan's advanced machines. Circe's unpredictable storms often saw winds in excess of 200 kilometers, threatening all but the most resilient of vehicles, and buildings. This accounted for the bunker mentality of many Circean factions. Large storm systems could be predicted with the appropriate weather monitoring technologies, which the clans had, but the locals did not. But sudden flare-ups, so-called hell storms, could arise quickly and wreak devastation on the unprepared. Adding to this, the particulate matter whipped up by the storms, even the mildest, had a way of insinuating itself into every gap, clogging filters and jamming machinery, requiring vastly increased maintenance to keep equipment in working order. Infantry too needed to be equipped with filter masks to prevent inhalation of dust that was now laced with toxic heavy metals. The Northern Campaign Clan Snowraven and Wolverine were assigned the task of liberating northern Circe. Landing on July 2nd at Point Alpha, an isolated oasis on the northern fringes of the equatorial deserts. Timed to coincide with a sandstorm, thankfully not a hellstorm, the operation began with an orbital drop to secure the LZ. The dropping mechs were shepherded by aerospace fighters, and while the Snow Ravens landed without loss, their remembrance indicates the other force with them, presumably the Wolverine Townman, was hampered by the crippling of one of their pathfinders. This was most likely because of broken leg actuators from a heavy landing. Nonetheless, the operation proceeded smoothly, and soon Raven and presumably Wolverine dropships grounded at the site, disgorging troops and supplies, and establishing a fortified enclave to support the northern operation. For eight days, patrols ranged from Point Alpha, extending up to 250 kilometers from the base and drawing several scattered settlements under the clan Aegis. Intended as little more than shelters from the southern storms, these were never intended as permanent habitation, but the clan sweeps did catch several bands of travelers in them. These were members of a loose coalition known as the Sand Confederacy, a collection of nomadic tribes that in many regards predated Nicholas's second exodus. A number of people, chafing at the Star League and Exile's rules, had decided to eke out an existence in the desert fringes, and their numbers had swelled considerably when the Exodus Civil War sent large segments of the population fleeing from the polar regions. Distrustful of the newcomers, the dozens of nomads swept up by the clan patrols were initially sceptical of their liberation, but many were won over, to a degree, by the clan's willingness to share food and water, something the Confederacy believed created a sacred oath between a host and their guest. On the 11th of July, a heavily armed nomad band attacked a Snow Raven patrol 25 kilometers from Point Alpha. 
Ordinarily, the small arms would have had little effect on the armoured behemoths of the clans, but the assault came as one of their mech warriors had dismounted to clear a clogged filter. A burst of small arms fire tore into the warrior's torso and legs, but he managed to return fire with his sidearm. Realising the situation, the other mechs quickly sanitised the area and recovered their comrade, only then to come under medium calibre fire from another direction. These hit-and-run tactics became the norm for clashes with the Sand Confederacy, the clan technological advantage allowing them to quickly overcome opposition, but first they had to find their enemy. Most of the early engagements were triggered by the natives, but by mid-July a number of bands had been neutralised, their leaders killed in battle, otherwise brought to heel when their camps were discovered by Kerensky's troops. Though only the Snow Raven operations are known in detail, it seems likely that the Wolverine forces faced similar difficulties, though the scope and nature of their operation can only be guessed. There are indications of joint operations during the first six weeks of the campaign, but in the months that followed, the two clans operated independently. The last major clash of the Confederacy operation was the city controlled by a warlord simply known as Dun. Situated in one of the few verdant regions of the Circean deserts, the valley's lush vegetation fed by a major aquifer much of the city, and it had been abandoned, with most of the population fleeing. Nonetheless, much of the city's infrastructure was intact, and the ravens were at pains to cause the minimum of collateral damage when seizing control of the settlement. Capturing it, gave the Snow Ravens de facto control of the region through their control of the water. Ironically, it was the same method used by many of the Circean warlords. Rather than use it to force their will on the remains of the Confederacy, they made it clear that their resources were something anyone could utilise, a far cry from Dunn's strict regime. They stated that they wouldn't interfere in the Nomad's activities as long as clan law was respected. And in one fell swoop, they brought many of the recalcitrant tribes on side, and obviated the need to bring them all to heel militarily. A feat that could have taken them months. That allowed them now to turn their attentions to Cersei's more dangerous factions. As a side note, Dunn's camp, Dera Dunn in the Hindi of the Marak originated tribe leader, became the Raven's de facto capital on Cersei, distinct from the joint clan operation point at Alpha. After Klondike, the Ravens exploited the pre-existing infrastructure and quickly established a thriving metropolis. However, it was also at Deradun that one of the greatest atrocities of the Wolverine treachery would unfold in 2823, a little over two years after the landings. The Empire of Hidalgo Taking control of the Sand Confederacy was a strategic decision, but one that was essentially without malice. The clans cared little whether the Confederacy cooperated with them or opposed them. They were, in many regards, irrelevant. Their next target was one of the most brutal regimes on Circe, however, the Empire of Hidalgo, or, as its leader named it, the glorious imperial dominion of the god-king Hidalgo. Antonio Hidalgo had been an SLDF lieutenant who had fought in the war against Amaras, but been demobilised in the years after arriving in the Pentagon due to concerns about his mental state. Always devout, he had turned to preaching and established a significant congregation. His apocalyptic message had caused concern with the authorities, but with Generals Kerensky and de Chevalier occupied with rising political tensions among the SLDF in exile, that would eventually culminate in the de Chevalier massacre in General Order 1721, little was done to bring him to heel. When Circe collapsed into anarchy after Alexander's death on Eden, Hidalgo's followers seized the opportunity to turn their vision into reality. They established a theocratic empire with Hidalgo as their head of state, and began to mete out divine justice to those who didn't adhere to the tenets of their new faith. Initially, they singled out the clerics of established faiths, taking them in for re-education, but soon this expanded to be congregations of those faiths. The exact body count of the purges will probably never be known, but estimates vary from 20 to 40,000 fatalities in 20 years. Fear became a tool of policy, and Hidalgo's white-clad militia, the means by which his will was enforced on the population. The clans knew of the Empire of Hidalgo, and had suspicions as to the extent of his crimes, though the details didn't emerge until after Klondike, when numerous mass graves were uncovered. The geography of the Hidalgo territory, 
each settlement being a mini fortress controlling travel and access to shelter and water, made it a difficult target to attack without a secure base, hence the establishment of Point Alpha. However, the difficulties with the Sand Confederacy had allowed word of the landings to percolate through the agents of the God King, and thus the Brigada de Dios, his militia, literally known as the Brigade of God, were now prepared for the assault. Concentrated airstrikes on the Brigada positions forced them to abandon the open terrain, but the Ravens were unwilling to risk irreparable damage to the civilian infrastructure, especially the reservoirs, aqueducts and irrigation systems that were vital to sustaining the population. Once they realised this reticence, the diametric opposite of how Sun clans acted on Eden, the militias exploited it ruthlessly using the population and infrastructure as a shield against the attackers while undertaking suicide operations, often forcing citizens to become living weapons, their loved ones held hostage by the Brigada. The campaign to crush the Empire became a protracted affair, with each settlement having to be carefully invested and reduced. While there were no massive disasters for the Snow Ravens, attrition did begin to take its toll. Khans McKenna and Merrill were confident of success against Hidalgo's forces, but Kerensky was less sure, and contemplated bolstering the Raymond forces with troops from another clan. Aid came, however, from an unexpected source. The Kerensky Dominion While much of Circe's society collapsed into sectarian and ethnic violence, some people attempted to hold on to the attitudes and morals of the Star League. One such group was the Kerensky Dominion a small group of Terran loyalists led by a triumvirate drawn from the military, political, and religious elements of society. Unlike many other groups, the Dominion hadn't sought to dominate its neighbours, though it had occasionally attempted to act as a neutral party or peacekeeper in any disputes, and retained a relatively high level of technology. Despite their lack of numbers, the Dominion's martial prowess discouraged adventurism by their neighbours. Rumours of the clan assault made their way to the triumvirate, and on the end of August, the Snow Ravens were still engaged with the Hidalgos. The Dominion decided to make their move. Elements of the Raven Townmen were assaulting Salamanca, the fifth fortress city of the Empire, when they were alerted to a new incoming force. Suspecting Brigada reinforcements, the Ravens adopted a defensive posture, but were puzzled when these new arrivals signalled them with an SLDF authentication protocol, albeit an old one. They then proceeded to engage the militia, in less than a day, the Hidalgos were driven from Salamanca, and the Ravens found themselves with new allies in the war to liberate the Pentagon. For their part, the Dominion pledged themselves to the Sons of the Great Father, expecting that Nicholas's group would welcome them with open arms. However, matters were much more complex, with Khan McKenna expressing a cautious optimism about the Dominion, while Nicholas was less inclined to accept the partnership at face value. Nonetheless, Utilising the Dominion infantry and armour together with the mechs and air power allowed the Empire campaign to be brought to a close by the end of September. Hidalgo was apprehended while attempting to escape his capital, after ordering his forces to fight to their last drop of blood, but committed suicide before the clans could bring him to trial. After a brief pause to repair and rearm, the Raven forces, together with their new Dominion auxiliaries, moved against the Tabor Vevoidat, a supposedly democratic proto-state of free world's heritage. After a handful of clashes, the table resistance crumbled, and the Ravens quickly moved to take control of key centres. Only in Brno, the table seat of government, was there any significant opposition, and that took the form of protest marches and strikes. The ease of this conquest was a relief to the Ravens and a contrast to operations elsewhere in the north, the Wolverines were entangled in a series of bloody clashes with the Rasmussen elite, a chaotic martial society that epitomised the might-makes-right philosophy. Unlike much of the Wolverine operation on Circe, the clashes with the elite were witnessed by Raven observers. The Ilkhan himself made some notes in his journal about them, calling the elite our Shadow Brothers, a martial society without responsibility or limit, a society where prowess has corrupted rather than protected. Against the Elite Few clan records exist of the Wolverine campaign against the Rasmussen Elite. The Wolverines' own records were purged and many of the Snow Raven records lost in the destruction of Dera Dun in 2823, but a history of the campaign does exist, from the Elite's point of view. 
The autobiographical work 16 Minutes of Hell was written several years after Klondike by Kurt Mankel, an elite Macquarie of Rasel Hagian heritage, who was imprisoned for several years before being placed in the Snow Raven's technician cast. His dour prose, written originally in Swedenese, in contravention of Nicholas's language dictates, was written during his imprisonment, and provides detailed and compelling, if often disturbing, insight into the bloody campaign against the elite. Described politely as thugocracy, the elite were a strange mix of Lyran, Combine, and Terran warriors who imposed their will on the population of their territory through fear and intimidation, and their control of several lances and mechs. They took and did what they wanted, providing protection for those in their domain in exchange for their every whim being met. Disputes were settled via combat, often to the death, and individually they were excellent warriors. However, personal skill and the ability to intimidate peasantry with a 10 meter war machine didn't translate into an effective military, and though controlling a significant portion of the Northwest, the elite were brushed aside by the Wolverines and treated as little more than a nuisance. Nonetheless, as individual warriors, the elite were a match for the clans, though their equipment often let them down, and the dangers of one-on-one -on -one engagement and even small unit operations soon became apparent. After several losses and close calls, Khan McEvity ordered her troops to avoid such encounters and to use coordinated tactics to deal with opposition, a marked contrast to what would become the official clan rules of engagement that Nicholas would lay down after the events of Eden later in the year. Their relegation to irrelevant status infuriated the remaining elites, who descended en masse on the Wolverines at Chamberlain's Crossing. Eight battlenecks, sixteen tanks and roughly a company of infantry roared toward Khan McEvity's force, howling and lashing out with every weapon they had. The clans weathered the storm, allowing the elite to wash over them and then, with a precise demonstration of the coordination that the Circeans lacked, set about smashing the native troops. In a battle that lasted sixteen minutes, the Wolverines annihilated the opposition. Only five Rasmussens survived the fight, Mankel being among them, while the Wolverines sustained negligible casualties. One clan mech warrior had been killed, another suffered a broken back, but other injuries to Kerensky's troops were minimal. With the elite effectively wiped out, and the Battle of the Crossing standing as a testament to the prowess of the clans, the civilian population greeted their liberators with open arms. The Battle of Bitter Tears the arrival of the Kerensky Dominion had turned the tide against the Hidalgo Empire, but cracks in the alliance soon began to show during the short Tabor campaign. The Snow Raven remembrance portrays what happened as a betrayal, but the truth of the matter is more complex. For their part, the Dominion thought they were keeping the truth of the League alive, and thus thought to be an honour to work with Nicholas's forces. The clans thought that in the Dominion they would have obedient followers in the liberation of the Pentagon. The reality of the situation was quite different. The Dominion were not indoctrinated into the ways of Nicholas's clans, and found their methods and outlook alien. To many in the Dominion, the clans weren't the true heirs of Alexander, but rather a corruption of Kerensky's ideas. Their expectations of being partners in the operations were quickly rebuffed, with the Snow Raven and Wolverine commanders expecting to lead in all cases, and for their orders to be obeyed without question, and Dominion troops often seemingly used as cannon fodder. Their exclusion from command decisions rankled the Dominion, and the Circeans' questioning of directives exasperated the clans. Throughout the late September and early October, tensions had begun to rise between the two sides, finally erupting into a series of brawls between Dominion and clan troopers. While the clans did punish some of their own for their involvement in the clashes, the majority of the punishment fell on the Dominion troops, further fueling the tensions. On the 14th of October, Colonel Michael Guillory, a senior Dominion officer, made an unscheduled visit to Stephen McKenna's HQ in Dera Dunn. Ostensibly, it was a social call, the visit's main purpose being to protest the treatment of Dominion troops. It soon became apparent that no compromise was likely, and tempers became frayed, with deadly consequences. The Snow Ravens claimed that Guillory made an attempt on the Khan's life, but that McKenna's skill instead resulted in the death of the would-be assassin. This triggered a wide-scale conflict between the Dominion and both the Snow Raven and Wolverines. Realising the danger of the situation, the two clans had already made preparations to neutralise the Dominion troops, and the assassination attempt provided the trigger. There have been suggestions that the Ravens orchestrated the clash, much as they are alleged to have done with the Wolverines two years later, but the clashes in and around Derudun came within a whisker of shattering the clan, 
which argues against any form of premeditation. Later called the Battle of Bitter Tears, the battle between the Dominion and the Snow Ravens lasted three days, though the fighting was most intense in the first six hours. Acting on the news of Guillory's death, his murder in their eyes, Dominion troops moved against the Raven command post and though lacking the technology of the clans, had the advantage in numbers. The Ravens in Deradun were in grave danger of being overrun, and only a non-stop procession of close air support missions, sometimes bombing Dominion formations within a few dozen metres of the Raven lines, allowed the clan to weather the storm. At one stage, Khan McKenna called down airstrikes on his own position, trusting in the precision of his troops not to hit his transponder marked location. By the midday on the 15th of October, the Dominion was spent force-wise, but it would take another two days to neutralise them. With the exception of the Raven HQ, casualties were light on both sides, the Raven and Wolverine troops disarming the Dominion forces before news of the battle could spread thanks to their control of the communications network. The Last Campaign The Long Campaign and the Battle of Bitter Tears in particular had denuded the Snow Raven ground forces, and while the Wolverines were believed to be in significantly better shape, Nicholas dictated that the two should undertake the final operation of the Northern Campaign. The Wolverine Khan, Sarah McEvity, clearly saw herself as a senior officer whose strategy would shape the battles against the Davian-originated Isle of the Eagles, or L'Ile de Agile in the French that they favoured. Stephen McKenna and Joyce Merrill took offence to this, but had to accept the reality of their weakened position. McKenna would oversee flight operations in support of the Wolverines, while Merrill would lead the ground forces. The Eagles saw the writing on the wall, but put up a stiff resistance to the combined operation. Doing everything in their power to slow the clans, the Wolverines used their speed and manoeuvrability in an attempt to flank the enemy, while the Ravens used their air power to support offensive against a succession of fortifications. More often than not, the Eagles faded away before the Wolverines, avoiding any open field engagement in which the clans would have their decisive advantage, while the Raven losses in their fortress uh, busting roll steadily mounted. On the 19th of November, the Eagles were brought to battle outside the city of Hamilton, Wolverine scouts having spotted their movements and allowing Sarkhan Merrill to interdict their escape route. With a massed Wolverine force approaching their rear, the Davianists threw themselves at the Raven force arrayed on the Constance Ridge. However, rather than the company strength force Merrill expected, there were close to a battalion facing the battered Raven force. The Ravens were the anvil to the Wolverine's hammer, but the cost was high. Almost half of the Raven ground force was destroyed in the bloody clash, with Joyce Merrill the highest ranking casualty. Though documentary evidence of her fate is contradictory, with some suggesting she survived. While the Ilkhan praised both clans for their determination in bringing the Northern Campaign to a close, McKenna suspected that Wolverines had deliberately underrepresented the forces heading for Constance Ridge, souring relations between the two. Some histories reference a soured romance between Merrill and Franklin Harris as a factor here, but it's unlikely that personal disputes would have had such an impact on Klondike. There is also scant documentary evidence for this affair, though it's been noted the destruction of the Wolverine records and the loss of many Raven documents in the New King of Deradun have hampered detailed historical investigation. The Southern Campaign as with the northern landings, the assault on the four southern regions began with the establishment of an equatorial base, imaginatively named Point Beta, where troops and supplies could be landed free of interference. While there were some desert nomads, their numbers were small and lacking the hierarchy of the Sand Confederacy, and the presence of Kerensky's troops almost went unnoticed. After a week of preparation, Combat operations began on the 9th of July, with a joint mongoose Novacat force driving into the Emerald Kingdom, the largest of the southern proto-states, whose leadership was of Capellan heritage and styled themselves Yuntha, or Warlords. Politically and economically, they were the most cohesive power bloc in the region, but while they had a sizable and for Cersei well-equipped military, their territory lacked natural defences, and Nicholas judged them the easiest prey. The initial clan assaults came as a great surprise to the Yunfa, in much the same way as their assault on the Inner Sphere were 230 years later, with border garrisons seeming to just disappear as the alien attackers swept in. The first the leadership knew of the invasion were the waves of refugees streaming from the border. There had been some attempt to stall these movements by the Mongoose clan, but they soon abandoned the effort. 
and they activated a succession of plans designed to halt the invasion. There were, however, two major flaws in the Yunfa's reasoning. The plans were designed to counter their peers, not Nicholas's elite, and they relied on key units holding the line. Key units the double clan invasion had, for the most part, already crushed. The campaign lasted 11 days, during which time the clan sustained only minor losses. Indeed, the single largest loss of clan life came during a friendly fire incident, when a faulty seeker head caused a bomb to deviate into a mongoose formation, killing two warriors. Khan Loris was typically pragmatic, quoting Nicholas's father, Friendly fire, a traditional military oxymoron. Securing the kingdom's capital, Gaifu, proved more problematic than the rest of the nation. Those Yunfa who hadn't fled commanded a dogged resistance that forced the clans to capture each district individually, bitter street fighting playing into the defenders' hands. Materiel losses escalated rapidly, though miraculously few clan troops were killed. The clearance operation took four days, and it was another two weeks before the situation was calm enough for the clans to lift martial law, with sporadic guerrilla attacks occurring right through into August. Divide and Conquer Nicholas drew up several plans for the second stage of the Southern Campaign, but the success of Blitzkrieg through the Emerald Kingdom prompted him to play to the strengths of the two clans, both of whom favoured speed and aggression in their operations. Rather than continuing the joint operations they'd followed since landing, each clan would now be assigned its own targets. The Novakats versus the Gant Republic, and Clan Mongoose against the Mongrel Mob, which each would deal with before any decision was made on the final leg of the campaign. Both clans saw this as their chance to shine, and in jovial mood after the final planning session with the Ilkhan, decided that they would treat the campaigns as a competition, each with a scorecard that factored in the speed of the campaign, their losses and damage inflicted, collateral damage, logistics consumed, and so on. The victor of their wager would be the preferred force for the final leg of the campaign. The Gant Republic was an amalgam of numerous cultures, with the people of no one successor state predominating. Instead, there were a collection of political, religious, and social factions constantly squabbling over resources and prerogatives. Khan Drummond joked that they were a miniature free world's league, and he'd every reason to know before Nicholas's exodus, the territory now claimed by the Republic was where he and his wife had lived. They'd experienced the factional politics of the settlers as well as the early power plays of Silas Gant, the democratically elected, for life, president of the Republic. Beginning on the 3rd of August, the Gant campaign was a game of cat and mouse. The Gants had considerable skill in defence, and had established a series of fortifications and caches. Unlike the Kingdom, they were aware of the approaching clans, and thus would not be caught napping. Even so, the speed and determination of the Novakats took them by surprise. Though twenty years had passed and dulled his recollection, Drummond's knowledge of the terrain was invaluable, and the Cats were able to strike where the enemy least expected, then withdraw almost as quick as they'd arrived. Supposedly impassable terrain became the favoured avenue of attack for the clans, instilling in the Gant troop a sense of paranoia. By the start of September, Gant morale was in tatters, and desertions were seriously denuing the Republican force. On several occasions, the clans approached a Gant fortification only to find it undefended, the troops having fled or on a couple of occasions having been shattered by fratricidal infighting. The threat of a firing squad did little to stem the collapse, and increasingly draconian measures further undermined the command structure. On the 11th of September, a group of deserters were shot in the central square of Concord, the Republic's capital. Rather than be cowed by this action, the assembled crowd was galvanised into action, but not the action Silas Gant had hoped for. A mass uprising began against the authorities, with civilians fighting troops hand-to-hand -hand on the streets. The mob armed themselves with looted weapons and soon turned their attention to the various barrack complexes and presidential palace itself. When the Novakats arrived at the city two days later, they found a scene of devastation and chaos. Authority had collapsed and lines of conflict had blurred in a spare of tit-for-tat attacks. Erstwhile allies turning on one another, enemies becoming allies of convenience. Stepping into this cauldron was something Philip Drummond didn't relish particularly as one of the first action the clans undertook was to cut down Silas's body from where he had been lynched outside his palace. 
but intervene they did, and over the next few days managed to halt the overt clashes. Despite the cat's best efforts, matters would simmer throughout the rest of 2821, only ending months later when Nicholas's social reforms and relocation programs came into effect. To the west, Clan Mongoose found themselves in a much more straightforward fight with warrior bands known as the Mongrel Mob. Only a government in the loosest of senses, the mob were a motley collection of warriors, with everything from SLDF vintage mechs to machine gun equipped motorbikes. Strength and charisma were what bound them together, and in most cases a hatred of the Brotherhood of Feana, the fourth southern power block whom the clans had yet to face. And unlike the Brotherhood, whose honour code was not dissimilar to that of the clans, the mob did what they wanted and took what they pleased. Their reputation was known across the south, and even during the conquest of the Emerald Kingdom, stories of this infamous mob were reaching clan ears. Hearing of the kingdom's collapse, several bands had staged incursions into kingdom territory, attempting to steal resources, only to be rebuffed by the remaining kingdom troops or clan advance scout parties. On one occasion, the clans observed what they thought was the factions of the mob turning on themselves during one such incursion, though after the battling the Fianna later in the year it became clear that the Brotherhood had intervened on several occasions and had supplied troops to the Gant Republic. Well-armed and aggressive, few in the mob had military training and tactics and teamwork were sadly lacking. The mob outnumbered Clan Mongoose by four or five to one in most of the engagements, but spent themselves in foolhardy, ill-coordinated attacks, and rarely managed to do more than inconvenience Khan Loris' troops. The biggest problem the clans faced was that the mob was so disparate, and each band had to be hunted down and neutralised separately. Sarkhan says, planned and coordinated the coursing of the mobs, but the difficulty in pinning them down turned what at first looked like a lightning-fast campaign, the principal settlements of the mob falling quite quickly to the clans in the first week, into a protracted affair. Khan Loris saw what he'd presumed to be a mongoose victory over the Novacats slipping away, and in danger of becoming a defeat. It took until the second week of October to bring the last of the mob to heel, but the Il Khan decreed the competition a draw. Though the cats had finished primary combat operations earlier, they were still embroiled in a policing action. Furthermore, he decreed that the assault on the Brotherhood would be a joint operation, allowing each clan to continue the policing actions in their occupied territories. Brothers in Arms the final series of operations against the Brotherhood was scheduled to begin on the 14th of October, but the near destruction of Point Beta prompted a swift change of plan. The southern clans had sufficient material to operate for a week or more, but the campaign was likely to be more protracted and so hurried resupply missions were arranged from the orbiting fleet and from the undamaged Point Alpha. However, the sudden outbreak of hostilities in the north between the clans and the Kerensky Dominion hampered efforts to supply the southern clans, and it was only once the dust had begun to settle there that Novacat and Mongoose received adequate materiel. To the surprise of Khan's Drummond and Loris, the Brotherhood of Fayana chose to exploit this enforced stand-down in a most unexpected manner. A company of Brotherhood troops approached clan territory, but rather than launching an attack, they called for a parley, and their representatives met with the Khans. Expecting a ragtag assembly, arrogant and ill-disciplined like the Mongrel mob, the poise and professionalism of the Fiana representatives came as something of a surprise. Michael Connolly was of Lyran heritage, and he'd drawn on the legends of his native Ark Royal to forge a proto-state that sought to bring order and civilization. They protected the people under their charge, and also operated in neighbouring states under contract. They recognised, however, that with the coming of the clans their services were no longer needed, and that they could step aside in favour of Kerensky's followers. All they asked in return, for ensuring a peaceful transition of power, was that their fellowships, the Fianna, be allowed to continue, and that they retain the weapons that they'd allowed them to maintain the peace for so long. Had the offer been made a week earlier, it's quite possible a deal could have been reached, but with the repercussions of the Kerensky Dominion campaign still fresh in their minds, the answer was no. What followed was a strange dance of combatants, one moment fighting bitterly, and the next extending the honours of war to the downed foe. There were numerous tales of battles being halted when mechanical failure compromised the operation of mechs and vehicles, resuming after repairs were effected, and of defeated warriors sharing meals with their captors. It was a far cry from the bitter clashes elsewhere in the Pentagon, more a clash of warriors because honour dictated they fight, rather than because either side wanted to. 
The strange end to the campaign didn't sit well with the Il Khan, who issued orders that matters be brought to a conclusion and the Brotherhood disarmed. His plans call for the dismantling of all Pentagon factions and their forced homogenization to avoid repeating the fall of the League in exile to factionalism. Nonetheless, Fionna warriors were much prized by the clans they were assigned to, becoming the nucleus of the second line troops each fielded. It is notable that unlike most of the other factions, none of the Fionna leadership faced capital punishment for their role in the Pentagon Civil War, though a number were censured, and their final capitulation on the 9th of December took place in an atmosphere more akin to a carnival than a surrender ceremony. Aftermath the news from Eden of Andrei Kerensky's death soon soured any sense of joy at the end of the Circe campaign, and though the four clans had completed the missions presented to them, it was clear much work remained to be done in the Pentagon. There was no end in sight for the Dagda campaign, and there was talk of redeploying the Novakats or Mongoose to bolster the effort. The Ravens and Wolverines were not considered for such a mission, needing as they did to rebuild from their brutal campaigns and so the Khans instituted a series of programs to maintain their fighting edge and to make good their combat losses. In the end, Clans Wolf and Jade Falcon were assigned the role, but the Khans felt their preparations were justified and served both clans well in the post-Klondike trials for resources and population. Circe campaign side notes. Death from above. Though the Snow Raven reputation as a naval and aerospace clan didn't fully manifest until after Operation Klondike, aspects were already taking shape during the campaign. Led by a former naval officer, this comes as little surprise, but their relatively weak mech force, of only four stars then, forced them to use air power as an integral part of their combat doctrine. In almost every battle the clans had aerospace supremacy, and thus only a minimal combat air patrol was needed, freeing the majority for ground attack missions. Some were employed strategically, interdicting bridges and supply depots, but most were employed tactically, supporting ground forces in the battle directly. To facilitate this, the Ravens employed a taxi rank system with a succession of fighters orbiting the battlefield, ready to be hailed and called down into action. Whether they were using bombs, missiles or direct fire weapons, the Raven fighters were uncannily precise and could engage targets within 25 metres of a friendly unit. If the ground unit was brave enough to call them in on a target so close, that was. This accuracy would prove to be vital in saving the Ravens during the Battle of Bitter Tears. Matters of Honour The 31st century perception of the clans is of an excessively honour-bound people, whose confirmation to a rigid code of conduct hampers their actions as much as it ritualises warfare and limits collateral damage. The original clans of the early 29th century bore few of these traits, and instead had an attitude closer to the total warfare methods of the SLDF in which many of them had served. The threats and actions of some clans, most notably the Smoked Jaguars, were not as far beyond the pale as our modern sensibilities would like to think. Though the brutality of aspects of Klondike would shape the clan attitude, Andre's death would lead to the Code of Zelbringen, but the Feana and their honourable attitude towards warfare are a little acknowledged factor in the shift of clan attitudes.